Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zev from Zell Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am back with my buddy Lee Stoffer. Lee, how are you doing? Good Zed, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good. So I'm at Lee's abode in Milton Keynes, which is about one hour. About 45 minutes outside London? What yeah, would you say? That, I suppose. Depends on your driving, right? <laughs> um, so if you're not familiar with Lee already, Lee has made many appearances on my channel. He's a very good friend of mine, as well as a mentor uh, and teacher for me in the fields of green woodworking and also spoon carving. Now, this video is part of an ongoing series where we're, with Lee, we're looking at sheaves for spoon knives. This is a topic that's not covered hugely in a lot of detail online. So I've collaborated with Lee. He's like my one of my main go-tos when it comes to this kind of topic and we're looking at a topic of spoon sheaves now this is a part two of that series now in the part one what we did we looked at an overview of a multitude of options you have available to you to make a sheaf for your spoon knife we looked at some incredibly simple, very crude ways of doing it, all the way to ones that are very, very sophisticated and everything in between. Now, what we're doing in this video is we're starting to double down now on the slightly more involved, slightly more intricate spoon, uh, spoon knife sheaves. So in this one, we're actually looking at a wooden spoon knife sheaf, yeah. okay, with a flip lid. Now, if you don't know what they are, don't worry, we're gonna be showing you as we work through this video. Now. A couple of things I will stress, and we're gonna cover this in a lot more detail in this next segment that we're gonna move on to, is the goal with this video is to work with as many basic tools as possible. This is Lee's workshop and it's fully set up. He's got like everything you can think of. Um, so obviously, not everyone's gonna have this. I don't have a lot of the tools that he has here. So as I spoke to Lee and we spoke about the logistics of making this video and, and this particular style of sheaf, we agreed that we're gonna try as much as possible to focus on tools that the majority of, of which you'll have, at the very least, maybe a couple of things here and there that I would say are fairly inexpensive yeah. uh, to get, but make the process a hell of a lot easier. Another thing I will stress as well is, and we're gonna get onto this in a moment, but there are like a million and one ways in which you can make a, a wooden box sheath for a spoon knife. The goal with this video is to enable you through Lee's teaching to be, to be able to make a functional, aesthetically nice looking, simple sheath for your spoon knife. Would you say that was the case? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is this way, if you go online and you see pictures of what, yeah, uh, uh, spoon knife sheaths that other people have created, like wooden ones, there's some really elaborate designs out there with all sorts of mechanisms and painting and decoration. But what the goal is with this video is for you to kind of make a version 1.0. If you've never made one, I've never made a wooden uh, uh, sheath for a spoon knife. So for me, I'm gonna be seeing it myself for the first time. So the goal with this video is to kind of enable you to get your first one made using some fairly simple tools. And then from there, once again, we'll go into this uh, in more detail as we move through this video. The goal is from there, you can then obviously use your imagination to really go wild with the kind of styles and variations of a wooden sheath for a spoon knife. So Lee, with your kind permission, if I get behind the camera, are we gonna look at the tools first in terms of what you're gonna to need to get going? Yeah, we'll look at the tools and the materials, uh, look at the basic design. We've made a little prototype. It's not, it's not a pretty thing, but it's given us an idea. And then, yeah, we'll look at the more involved procedure of actually from start to finish making the thing. Excellent, guys. So, hope you enjoy this video. A lot of this stuff I'm gonna be seeing for the first time myself. So Lee, with your kind permission, we'll get started. So guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video where Lee Stoffer is going to be teaching you how to make a wooden sheath for a spoon knife. So Lee, we're obviously gonna have an overview now of the tools and materials that we're gonna need. So yeah. where do you wanna begin? Well, I'll try to keep it fairly basic. I think most people have got a battery drill um, not everybody's going to have a coping saw, but there's kind of ways around that, which we'll talk about as we go. Files and rasps are quite handy for shaping wood if you're not that good with knives and or haven't, you know, don't want to use knives. And we've got different options on the timber that we use to keep it, you know, simple or not. The calipers are going to be quite handy for measuring things, but again, you could just use a, you know, a normal steel rule in most cases. We're definitely going to want some glue. Although again, we could screw this box together. I think it's going to be better with glue and a hand plane just for, just for finishing things off and maybe truing surfaces up. But again, we don't really need that. You know, a bit of sandpaper on the bench will have a similar effect. So we're keeping it simple. I'm going to use a clamp 
I'm also going to use a vise. Now, if you haven't got a vise, you can probably get away with clamping, th you know, clamping things to the bench to do a similar job. It's just much quicker and easier with a with a proper bench vise. So I will be using that just to make life easy. Um, but again, you'll probably get away with the clamp if you can't. So yeah, the basic materials we've got, there's a couple of options. I've got a simple bit of pine batten here, which I've actually just run through the bandsaw. You could do it with a handsaw, or you could you could even split it and then use the prepared surfaces and fit and refinish these inside surfaces. Or you could use plywood. But what we're ideally looking for is for the main body here, it's got to be at least as thick as the root of the blade, ideally, because this is what we're going to cut the slot in for the blade. So we're going to look to make that shape in this piece of wood. Okay. Now, so this is where you could just eyeball it or you could use your calipers and say, right, the root of the blade is sort of 16 millimeters thereabouts. And we've got a piece of wood that's just over 18 millimeters thick. So that's going to be like the filling of the sandwich, if you like. And then we're going to need a back and a front. So I've left those slightly oversized. This is the actual size piece of wood we want. I've left the back and the front slightly oversized so that we can get position before we finish trim them to, um, to their final size. Peg options. We're going to have a peg to secure this. Um, this is just a, a typical cheap bamboo chopstick. What really makes this easy is the fact that it's already got this taper. Okay, you could equally just split off a piece of the batten and carve this down and put your own taper on it with a knife. If you happen to have an old chopstick lying about or even a new one, you could use that. Depends how much work you want to make for yourself. The other thing we're going to need is a pivot point or a hinge. So again, we've got two options. A simple screw. What you are going to want is a bit of plain shank on that screw that's at least as thick as the section that you're going to use for the door. Okay, because when this door pivots, if it's pulling on the threads, it's the chance it's going to loosen and tighten the screw. If it's on this plain bit of shank, it can, it can swivel around quite easily. This is another option, which is a cabinet joiner. It's a bit like, if you do leather work, it's like a Chicago screw, but it's a bit longer. And it's actually designed to go in from either side of kitchen cabinets and, and bolt them together. The beauty of this is this post will sit through the full thickness of this, so then the door will kind of be able to hinge on it. So this part will remain static and then the threads are actually inside that. So there's two options. I think we're going to go with the screw just to keep it really simple because most people are going to find a screw in their spares box with a bit of a plain shank on it. But if you've got one of these kitchen cabinet joiners, that's probably going to be a slightly more kind of robust option. It might be worth thinking about recessing so that we lose the thickness of the head kind of inside the timber a little bit so it's a nice flush finish but that's far easier to do with these because we can just countersink it so this is the option we're going to go for is the pine with a simple brass screw your other options standard thickness plywood 18 mil 6 mil so if you've got scraps of plywood you could use that too so that's your, your basic options on the equipment and the materials to cut the slot we're going to use a drill in the in the battery drill we're going to use a coping saw to refine that and then maybe we're going to use a little needle file and a rasp and a file to possibly clean that up a little bit but again they're probably optional if you're half decent with one of these um, they're not a tool that everybody's going to have in their toolbox but they're cheap enough to buy if you haven't and we'll look at other options to do it without that if we really need to which would be to do what's called stitch drilling. So if you imagine we're drilling one hole there, then another hole as close to it as we possibly can. So you drill all, this is how this was done with a series of holes drilled out to make the shape. And then you can basically either file or carve out the remaining timber with the tip of a knife, but that's gonna take a bit longer. So we're gonna use the coping saw because I've got one. And they're not a bad thing to have in your toolbox and to learn to use anyway. I won't say that I'm an expert with one because I've got a bandsaw, so I don't tend to use it very often, but we're just try and keep this simple and just use hand tools. So let's make a start. So what we're gonna work with in this video is the basic Mora spoon hook. Now these have changed slightly over the years. This is a really old one and it had a really sharp point on it. The first thing I'd recommend you do if you've got an older one is just file that point off. It's absolutely useless and it will catch you eventually. Um, but what we're going to need to do to house this 
is to cut a slot in this piece of pine. So I've already cut this to length. Um, and if we look at it to house this particular hook, we're about 75 millimeters long, because what I want to do is include the ferrule in this so that we've got a good bit of location and strength in there. Now, this is going to be specific to this tool. Now, the beauty of this method is because we're doing this sandwiching thing, any, we can cater for any shape of hook knife whatsoever. The fact that they've got a curve in them means that when they're located in a slot, they can't fall out. That's the whole point of this method as far as I can see. But the first thing we're going to need to do is actually offer this up and mark out the material that we need to remove. So I'm just going to hold that, push the edge down onto it, and then take a pencil and just mark around what needs to come out to house the ferrule first. And then just draw around the shape of the blade basically and go around both sides. So then we've got the shape that we need to remove actually marked up on the wood. Hopefully that's pretty clear. Now, what we could do is measure this to see how thick the blade is. And it's actually about two and a half millimeters. So we could in theory drill a two and a half millimeter hole, but then we've got to try and run a saw around that twice and it's going to be a super tight fit. So I would recommend going up a little bit. I'm going to use a four millimeter drill. That's what I used for this. Okay. And because the blade's slightly tapered, the edge goes in easily, but then it actually sits in quite firmly just on its own kind of friction. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to use the hand drill for this as in a battery drill. So we just pop that in, make sure that's locked up. And then if ever you're working on your bench top and you're drilling, you don't want to drill holes in your bench top ideally. So we're going to work with this and actually just have this bit of scrap underneath. Again, what might be sensible at this point is to actually use a clamp just to hold things still while you're working. Um, in fact, let's, let's just set this up so that I can do just that. It's always preferable when you're drilling if you can have both hands on the drill to guide it. So I'm going to start with drilling the tip of where the hook's going to go and I want to try and keep that nice and vertical so I come out at the same place on the back as I went up the front. Now basically that gives me room to come in with the saw and turn around and go back but I'm also going to drill a, a couple of extra holes just to make life a little bit easy. So I'm going to come around to the top here so I can take this timber out in sections basically. Should make life a little bit easier for the saw. Another one about three quarters of the way around. I'm just going to change the clamp position slightly because what I want to do on the back sorry not on the back but where the ferrule is going to come in is drill out both corner positions so at that point we've got some reference points and you can see they've gone all the way through and into my piece of scrap now this is where i think it's going to be really quite handy to have a vice to do this bit because we can grip this nice and tight and keep it all safe while we're doing the cutting. So if I come in and just lock this up in the vice, so to begin with I'm going to make these two straight cuts down to these holes to remove the piece of material where the um, where the ferrule of the blade is going to sit. I could use the coping saw for this but I've got a, a Japanese pull saw here so it's going to be easier to maintain a straight line with this. So I'm going to come in on the pencil line, straight across, try and make sure I'm going to line up with the hole on the back. So I cut down to the hole there, same on the other side. Yeah, we don't want to go too far. 
So we can see now all we've done is cut down to those two holes. So we're going to go back in the vise at a bit of an angle. And this is the first cut I'm going to make with the coping saw. You can see these pins basically are the opposite side of where the, where the blade is facing. So these all want to, always want to sit in line with each other to make sure the blade's straight and you want to keep plenty of tension on this blade. But I'm going to go in here, hopefully, uh, let's just move this around slightly. So the whole point of this being able to turn is so that you can keep this part of the frame out of the way of where you're cutting. So I'm going to go into that hole, turn the blade so I can join up the dots. <laughs> So that's our first piece of waste removed and that's the bit that's going to house the ferrule of the blade. So now we can start this longer cut. So I'm going to put it in and get that cut as, as vertical as I possibly can and cut down to this first hole. So it doesn't matter really where the saw's sitting as long as this frame's out of the way. I'm going to start with the inside and you can set these saws up to cut on the pull or the push stroke. So this one's set to cut on the push stroke. So I'm going to start it on a corner. Try and get it to engage. And then the tricky part is to try and follow the line. down to that hole on the first side. Now I'm going to come down to the hole on the second side. our second little sliver of waste removed. So at this point we want to come around this bend. So whichever way you want to set it up in the vise to make that easy. What we've got to be aware of is we've got some quite short grain between this hole and the end so we don't want to be putting too much sideways force on that might split this part, split this wood apart. Um, so I'm going to set that up again so it's mostly vertical but I need to be able to see the second hole to come round to. And I also need to be careful and not to try and turn the saw too much in a hurry. But let's carry on from where we left off. It. So we've gone all the way through to the hole now. So you could kind of rewind and come back out or you could turn the whole thing around and then cut back the other way from that hole back. But because I've just done the turn in that direction, I'm going to come back and try and maintain that. our second little bit of waste coming out now. So we've got nearly all the way around now. So now what I'm going to do is actually put the saw in first and then clamp it in the vise. So I'm holding together the bits that are at risk of being split by the cut, by the cutting action. So I'm pushing backwards and forwards. I don't really want to be twisting this around. So by clamping these two bits back together in the vise, I'm offering a little bit of strength that will be put back when we glue the back piece on. So 
So the basic technique with these saws is a bit like with a band saw or a scroll saw is as you're actually doing the saw in action you need to be the saw needs to be moving backwards and forwards to be able to turn otherwise you just end up twisting the blade. So I'm struggling to get this out through this gap now because it's quite on quite a tight curve. So what I'm tempted to do is to spin the whole saw around and cut back uphill. So I'm going to turn this this blade around until the frame is on the opposite side and it's not in my way anymore. So I basically want the blade to be about there but this frame wants to be up out of the way. Okay, so then I can come in to get those in the right position. I'm going to have to come up in the vise very slightly to clear that. Still, still holding those two bits together. It's just so these lugs clear the bench. And then so from that hole, I'm actually coming back uphill now. Take that out of the vise and take the saw out and we've got most of that waste removed. It looks a bit thin here to me so I don't know if the blade is going to fit in that. We'll soon find out and yeah it's a bit tight I think it's spreading that wood apart so this needs a little bit of refining which we can do with that little needle file. It's not going to hurt to clean up this shape a little bit so we'll look at that next. Right, so we've got a hole roughly cut and it's a bit tight in this section. So we've got a couple of options. We could use a little needle file like this. This is a round one, which should sit in that slot. Or if you've got, if you buy a little selection of these, they're really worth having. You'll have one that's sort of like fairly flat, like a knife. So we can get in there and do that. But what I will do before I do anything else is hold it in the vise. Another option, as long as you observe the grain direction, you could potentially work from both sides just with the tip of your carving knife and just whittle in there, but I can feel just by, you can see by squeezing that how much I'm flexing it. So I'm probably putting it at more risk. And obviously if the wood breaks while I'm carving it, there's a good chance of stabbing myself. I'm just gonna work with the back of my thumb there, just to push it up a bit. So there's, there's all sorts of ways you could approach this. This is not a particularly safe way. So let's look at a, a more sensible way of doing it. Let's put it back in the vise again. If the round needle file will go all the way through, then we should be able to work our way round and leave it an even diameter all the way through. So there's a tight spot there that I need to work a little bit. Now files are not traditionally woodworking tools, but in tight spaces like this, they're quite often a really helpful option. This one's struggling a little bit, so I'm gonna use this flat one, which is thinner and should fit through the gap more easily. And I'll file the inside surface first, because that's the easier one to, to get. bit tight in there as well. Certainly don't try and force the file because you'll break it. But once we can get the tip of that file around the bend, I think there's a good chance that the, the actual blade of the knife will fit in there. And when that goes round, hopefully, it's still a bit tight for the round file, so I'm just going to flip it round and work from the opposite side because it feels like it's a bit tighter at the back than the front. So it's just a particularly high spot there. Hopefully that should do the trick. So just going to quickly test fit the knife again. Obviously be aware that you're pushing a sharp blade through this, so don't have your fingers right on the back of it. 
but that's now going in quite nice and flush and it's, it's quite a nice tight fit. Something to ask, um, obviously you're using seasoned wood. Yes. Um, so for those watching, if they were to be using green wood, is that advisable? No, because what's going to happen is as it dries, this is all going to shrink and move. And also you wouldn't want to put a steel blade in wet wood. So as much as you're going to carve with it, you certainly don't want to store it in it. So I'd definitely start with a, a, some seasoned scrap. The reason I'm using pine is because it's much easier to work than, than, than the hardwoods. So like if you're using ash or oak, it'd make a stronger box, but you're going to have to work a lot harder to, to remove the material. Um, most people have got scraps of pine knocking about. If not, you know, you'll find that you could make it out of bits of pallet, for example. It's easy enough to come by this material. Um, if you're going to use wood that you've harvested from a tree, cut it to the right dimension, near the right dimensions, and then season it, and then actually do the work. You could take out some of the, well, say take out some of the waste while it's green. But actually, with what we're doing here, it's, it's far easier to work this wood with these tools when it's a bit more seasoned. So I'm just going to sort of clean up where we've been with the drill and the saw because we've got the opportunity now. When we put the back on it we won't have the opportunity to work through it with a file like this because it'll have a back. So I want to do any of this work now while I've got the opportunity to get in there and be able to push something all the way through. So that did feel like that it was pinching slightly. This is another place where in theory you could use the tip of your knife or a chisel just to carve out some extra waste. But it's, again, it's a bit fiddly. Could come down in here like this maybe, just to take a bit more out of there and then wiggle the tip in. But again, I can feel this flexing around in my hand because we've weakened it effectively by taking this material out. So I think in the interest of safety, work with tools that are far less likely to cut us if we slip. Just clean these corners up a little bit till we get a nice comfortable fit. Soften these inside edges. Yeah, so now that's a much more comfortable fit. It's not flexing the wood apart and it's sitting in there quite cleanly. So Lee, before we move on to the next stage, yeah. um, obviously you've shown this particular technique for hollowing out the yeah. shape. Yeah. Um, what other options are there available? Um, well, to cut this curve, it's quite a tight space that we're working in. So the, the really simple option would be stitch drilling. So you drill the one hole and then as close as you can to it, normally about its width, of, you know, it's, it drills width away. You're going to drill another hole, drill another hole, drill another hole, drill another hole until you've worked your way all the way round. So you're basically going to end up with a sort of join the dots kind of scenario going on. Then you could either use your knife or a chisel or a file to, to basically pick out that waste in between the holes. All right. Um, another option might be is if you've got an electric scroll saw, you could use that. Um, you know, if you've got a really fine blade in your bandsaw, you might get around it with that. Another option would be if you've got um, some wire or an old coat hanger, if you could bend that to the shape of the blade, you could heat that up with a blowtorch and then actually burn this slot in. Definitely do not heat up your blade with a blowtorch and burn it in with that because you'll have no temper left in the steel. But yeah, the long and the short of it is anything we can do to remove this waste whilst retaining this sort of like the strength in it at this stage without breaking it basically if I really pinch that together we'd probably split it across here that's why I've left it a bit tall here actually so we've got plenty of strong grain but of course once we've glued on a backing piece we're back to kind of like a solid lump again so that's going to be the next part of the job now this is just an old piece of batten that we're working with so I've got a clean flat surface there but it's I say clean it's it's a bit grubby and the back of this is a bit as well so I've just got a bit of sandpaper on the bench, pin that down, just to key up this surface a little bit. Rub that batters and fuels forwards a few times, it'll give the glue a good surface to key to and make sure it's nice and flat. Same with this. And you'll notice this is oversized, there's a reason for that. It 
when you're making stuff like this, it's really easy to get stuff out of alignment. So I've left this extra long, basically. So I'm gonna leave a bit hanging out the top. It's easy enough to pinch it into alignment on the side, but when we clamp it or put it in the vise, it's just handy to have a little bit of extra material to hold on to and make sure everything's lining up properly. So bearing in mind, we don't really want glue where the blade's gonna go, it doesn't really matter. But I'm gonna put the glue on the back. So I'm, I'm gonna consider that this being a right-handed hook, we're gonna put it in edge down like this. So I'm gonna consider that we want the spine coming out first. So the solid part that's not gonna move is gonna be the back. So I'm gonna flip this over, apply a little bit of PVA glue. And this is the best glue, when you're gluing wood together, PVA is by far the best in my experience. It's designed for the job. So you just wanna get a bit of glue on there. You can rub it in with a little bit of scrap. So I'm just using a bit of scrap timber there just to move that all around. Make sure we've got good coverage on the whole surface. Now, alternatively, if you were in a real hurry, you could pick a couple of points where there's enough meat left on the timber there and actually just screw this together. You're gonna to get a much stronger bond and no metal work in it if you wanna carry on doing further work like chip carving it afterwards. Far better off to have a glued surface where it's just all wood than you are to have loads of metal inside it. Then we're gonna put it on there just wiggle it backwards and forwards a little bit so we transfer some glue onto the other piece. And then you've got a couple of options here. You can either just set it on the corner of the bench and use your clamp to hold it down, or we can set it up in the vise. We're gonna get a better clamping pressure there. So I'm gonna drop the whole thing in, make sure I'm lined up on the sides, just by putting fingers in and making sure before I nip this up, hold it tight and then squeeze that vise up. Hopefully you'll see a little bit of glue ooze out which means we put plenty on. And now we've got to leave that to set up for a little while. And that could take about an hour, an hour and a half really for that glue to take. So say, if you're in a real hurry, put some screws in the back while the glue's going off, or you could drill it and put dowels in, but just to keep it simple, we'll leave that for a little while to go off and then we'll come back and finish it off. Right, so we've left this in the vise to go off now. So we've basically got the backing that's made this all nice and solid now. And we've got that little fit in. Obviously it's not gonna go all the way in because we can't clear the handle here. So we can trim some of this waste off now and then we can work out where we're gonna sit the door, basically. So what I'm gonna do is just come across here and trim this back. So this bit of scrap's gonna come in useful again. I'm gonna take this saw and just trim this flush with the end of what we've already put on there. So leaving it oversized means we can trim it back nice and flush with that. And hopefully this will fit all the way in now. So that's going down in there. And we've got a nice flush fit. We've got a slight bulge here. That's because the ferrule is actually sitting on that base plate. So what I'm going to do is just take a tiny little bit out of here with a chisel um, just so that we can sit that all the way down so the ferrule is inside so the top will sit on nice and flush. What I might as well do is just trim this top surface while I'm at it. Okay. We could actually plane the sides up now, but we might as well do that when we've actually fitted the door. So all I want to do for now is just get in here and, and chisel a little bit out of there. So this is one tool that we didn't add to the list, but something like a, yeah, like a, this is a half inch, 13 mil chisel. So all I'm going to do is come in at the back there, give it a tiny little tap. Now this is where we're going across the grain so that it's a little bit harder wood. What you don't want to do is go hammering it in there because that's going where we're going with the grain. So I'm just going to rock it in there just to score the wood. It doesn't need a lot of effort to cut that part. And then I'm going to go back to the vise, secure that, and then hopefully just come onto that edge and just chip a little bit of waste out of there. That's going to give us some clearance for the ferrule. 
And if your chisel is nice and sharp, this shouldn't be too difficult a job to do. Just chip that out. Like this. There's only a couple of millimetres have gone in there. Let's see if that's got us where we want to be. We might need to take a bit more out. But no, see now, but looking at that from the side, we can see everything's sitting nice and flush. So that's just made a little bit of space for the ferrule to sit in. So now we can worry about the door. So one of the considerations that we need to make with the door is we can't start with this super over length because it's going to fail the handle. So say let's we're going to come up so we can clear the ferrule. We can leave it overhanging a little bit. I'm actually going to go that way around. So I can let it hang a little bit there at the moment, but we've got to work out the position. Because what's going to happen is when this swings round, if I illustrate with this part, where we hinge it is going to make a difference. If I hinge it kind of here and spin it round, it's never going to open to let the blade out. So we've got to come quite high up into this corner. So I'm saying probably around here, hinge it so it turns from that point and then the door's actually going to get out of the way of the blade. Hopefully that makes some sense. So I've already kind of marked that position on this piece here. And then if I use this so it hangs out, I can actually test it. But more importantly, I can drill the hole while there's still plenty of material for me to drill it and countersink it and not risk splitting out the end grain. So I'm going to use this bit back to front. Just one question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, when you do have the lid on top, do you have to be mindful of the overall thickness based on the screw you're going to be using? Yes, well what we want is for this part, see we want this to run on the plain shank of the screw. So bear in mind we're going to countersink this in so the screw sits nice and flush. What we want is for this bit to be running on this plain part of the screw, not on the thread. We want all of the thread to go into this part to hold it nice and secure. Okay, so let me try and illustrate. If we put that on there, then the door's going to kind of sit behind it and pivot on that plain part. So the, the benefit, the potential benefit of using one of these cabinet joiners is with this screw system, we're gonna put the screw in and actually that screw is just gonna go into the, 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 the filler of the sandwich, if you like. It's not gonna go all the way through to the back. The bonus of using this is it would go all the way through the whole thing. So this bit would actually sit up there so you'd see we'd be running on a plain bit of shank but this screw would actually secure the whole box together as well as the glue holding it this would hold the back and the front on and then we could it'd be easy to adjust the tension so there's there's your two options we're going to do it with this screw because like i say most people have these kicking about not everybody's going to have one of those in their toolbox i mean you could probably go and pinch one out of your kitchen but let's let's do it the basic way we could always look at this option on another occasion. So I'm gonna I'm gonna line this up now at the bottom because we've got that opportunity. And we wanna come in the right distances. So I've marked these distances here as about eight millimeters. Okay, so what I'm going to do is offer this up. I'm gonna mark on here where the edge of the box is. Okay, and then from that line down, I'm gonna draw a line that's eight millimeters away. I'm going to come in there. Then from the edge, I'm going to mark a line that's eight millimeters away. And again, this is where you might find that a plywood front, because of the potential, because it's being close to a corner, if you've got it open and you lean on it, it could easily split. Obviously the plywood as an option is a similar sort of thickness, but you've got at least three, three laminated plies where the grain's going to be going in opposite directions. So if you find out that what you've used isn't as hard wearing and as effective as you wanted it to be, then you know, go back and use a piece of plywood instead. But we're going to again just stick to what a lot of people are going to have kicking about. So, what I've got in this drill is a pilot drill with a countersink. To start with, what I'm going to do is actually just drill this through on the blank. just till I'm through that, okay? Then I'm gonna put it back on here and I'm gonna hold it in line with the bottom of the box. I'm gonna pinch it down. In fact, let's do this properly and I'm gonna clamp it down again so that we can make sure nothing moves around. So 
So I'm going to roughly get that in place, give the clamp one click, just get the position dead right, lining up on the sides, lining up at the bottom. Then I'm going to give it a couple more clicks just to make sure it doesn't move around. Then let's come in, drill through the same hole. So we've got that for a guide. And put a little bit of a countersink. See, I've done that in one operation. We've got that little bit of a countersink in there. Now, again, while this is still nicely supported by the extra timber, this will be a good time to put the screw in. We've got to be a little bit careful that we've drilled the pilot hole deep enough actually. So thinking about it, I'm just going to take this out because we've effectively, because we've been countersinking at the same time, we've effectively not piloted into this very far. So I'm just going to give that the full length of the pilot so that this screw going into that piece of wood doesn't then split it out of the end of that. So put that back in that hole. A lot of these plain shank brass screws will come with a traditional slot head rather than a Phillips. So pop that in there. And tighten it down until it's firm enough that it can swing. Then obviously this bit of wood is now covering the gap. We need to get rid of that now. So now is the time when we can turn this upside down again and saw this waste away. All right, so now we hopefully should have a box that swings, the lid swings all the way out of the way. Out that comes. In it goes. So all we need, really need now is something that's going to hold this in a closed position. I'm going to, we want to sort of finish, this is a bit rough. Um, so I just want to sink that screw in a little bit deeper or I could actually remove it altogether and just finish this surface. But while it's in situ, just to make life easy, if we take the, take the knife out, we can just, as I say, if you haven't got a hand plane, you could just finish it on the sandpaper like this. It's just about started to touch the screw now. We've got a reasonably smooth surface. Again, if you have got a little, a little block plane or a little hand plane, it's going to help to just chamfer these edges back a little bit, just to make them less sharp, makes them less prone to cause problems. If you wanted to, just to make sure everything's nice and flush, we could hold the whole thing in the vise. So then if you've got a nice, a nice hand plane like this one, we can plane the whole thing up. Just to make sure everything's sitting nice and flush. Do both sides. Just cleans up. So this isn't a new piece of timber. It's been kicking around for a while, so it's a bit dirty. That sounds like it's going to benefit from painting in the opposite direction. There we go. And then we could even plane the end grain, in fact, or we could sand it. So there's options. You could just use your knife to come along and bevel this, bevel these sharp edges back. There's no. You don't have to do it any particular way. Just whatever's going to give you a nice, nice result with whatever tools you've got. Just be mindful when you're coming off the edge, you're better off cutting back towards the center just to save tear out. Same as if you're planing, you want to plane towards the middle and not come all the way off this edge where it's likely to chip out. So let's just chamfer these edges back. And again, you could do this with the rasp. We could put this in the vise and use this tool just to smooth the edges off. So whatever you've got, whatever you feel comfortable using, just gonna do this with the knife. 
and then go back and finish it that way. Keep it nice and clean. And then all we've got to do now is to provide ourselves some kind of way for the, the door of the, the box not to open. So at the moment, we're just relying on the pressure in the screw to create like a friction fit, which it's doing reasonably well actually. That's not gonna fall open, but obviously it could get knocked in a bag and then we're at risk of breaking the part where the screw goes. So the next thing we're gonna look at doing when I've just finished chamfering off this last, this last edge is to actually make a little peg just to locate. So what I'm gonna do is measure up that chopstick that we found and use that and I'm going to drill two holes. Now where we want to be drilling those holes is obviously in a part where we've got some meat in all of the parts to go into. So I'm going to aim for around here. So if I just hold a thumbnail on there we want to come in to that centre part about 15 millimetres in. So a thumbnail there, 15 millimetres in from the edge in line with that and we want our peg hole about here. Okay, we could come, you, know, you could come right down into this corner if you want, but I'm, I'm happy for it to go there, I think. So then here is our chopstick. So these are made out of bamboo traditionally, so they're ever so strong for their, for their size. And we've got this nice taper from around three and a half mil, right up to where it's square, it's like six mil, six and a half mil. So the roundest part there is a six mil hole. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill a four mil hole all the way through and then I'm going to open it up in the door about and about halfway through I'm going to go probably go four mil, five mil, six mil in series. So let's pop that down again. We have got in here at the moment I think a four mil drill bit. Yep. So first thing we're going to do make sure the drill set so it's going to find its way all the way through. And then what I'll do again, just from a safety point of view, you could just hold this still, but if anything then goes, it starts moving around, you've got the potential of drilling a hole in yourself. So let's just be safe, clamp it down, start the drill. Actually, a good tip, when you're gonna start a drill, poke a little hole first with a gimlet, just so the drill doesn't move around. So, Make sure that's tight. Try and keep it nice and straight again. So we're all the way through. Then lose that drill bit. And with the five mil drill bit, we want to go about half the way through. So I only want to drill to here, basically. We want to go about that far. So the easiest way to, to line that up um, is just with a piece of masking tape. Mark how deep you want to go. So we want to go to about there. Hold a, th hold a thumbnail on it. Just put a little bit of tape on the drill for a second. And then we can drill through there, right to the tape. Out with that. Then we're going to swap to the six mil and pretty much we're just going to drill through the door so i'm only going to go about just over a centimeter again i could tape it but i'm going to just eyeball this kind of get a feel for it and then we'll test it it might might not be quite deep enough yet but better to creep up on it so what i want is for this just to come through the other side look and that's gone so it's tight on the front it's reasonably tight on the back and it's going to hold itself in place Okay, so that's, that's stopping this swinging apart now. So now we can basically cut this to length. We don't need that full length. What you can see is we've still got, we've still got round up to about here. So as this hole wears, which it will, because the bamboo is going to be harder than the pine. So as this sort of spins around and gets tight, we've still got enough that that's going to keep getting tighter. Now, if you wanted to make this captive, you're going to want to leave a bit extra on. And really, you might want to start with a slightly bigger piece of timber so we've got room to drill a hole in it. Um, but we could just cut a groove and, and tie this on with a piece of string. I think for now, what we're gonna do is just trim this to length. So again, I'm gonna lay that down, and just use a little saw. 
just cut that off. And then, just to tidy it up, we don't want these sharp edges on the end. Just gonna chamfer the end of the peg. And that's best left in the job to do that because it's quite a tiny thing to hold on to. So if I leave it in its hole, it's wedged in quite tight. Just chamfer those edges back. Okay, so that's nice and clean now. And now the beauty of that is if, if it's stuck in the hole and it's too hard to pull out, you just put it down on the surface and out it comes. This is where it's probably worth being able to make it captive somewhere. But realistically, you can open it up and just poke it back in its hole anyway. It's, you're not gonna be without it for long. And how long is it gonna take you to whittle one of those out of some scrap timber if you did actually lose it? So you could tie it on somehow, drill a hole, tie a bit of cord on, something like that. But basically, we've now got what we wanted. So the knife fits in, the door swings shut, and then the peg holds it closed. So we've got a nice little enclosure very basic, but we could go on to sand it, smooth it out, decorate it if we wanted to. You could chip carve it, paint it, whatever you like, and it's quite a neat and tidy, tidy finish. So just thought of one last little touch. The fact that obviously we've got this peg is loose. We're not gonna make this one captive. We'll deal with that on another video. But because it's a piece of wood and it's a fairly small piece of wood, we're woodwork, we're working with wood. So it's quite often that you're gonna have a pile of shavings at your feet. And if you drop your peg in the shavings, you're gonna lose it. So all I've got here, this is, you're gonna find this in most people's houses, is a bit of nail varnish. So just a little blob on the end, just to color it up with a nice bright color. So it makes it a bit more easy to spot it in a pile of shavings if we happen to drop it. Makes it look quite funky too. So that's the thick end. We know we've got plenty of clearance on the thin end, so we'll just put a little drop on that end as well, just for good measure. Just so it makes life easier if we do actually drop it. And there we go, finished job. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Lee, you stud. No way. No <laughs> Thank mate. you so much. In case it doesn't need reminding. That's the first time I've seen the process myself start to finish off any style of wooden uh, sheath being made uh, uh, for a spoon knife. First time I've done it. <laughs> He's done really well. He's made loads in the past. He's just been humble. But this particular style, very specific to this one, is the first time he's made this one. But he's made loads for his uh, famous scorp, you know, and other tools that you do as well. But he does yeah. a lot of handling as well for, you know, people sending him in their blades that they've got from whatever maker, and you make the, the handles for those That's too. been done, yeah. Yeah, so he's very, very accomplished with the kind of the, the tool side of things. Now, seriously, thank you once again for that, Lee. So welcome. guys, a few reminders. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, uh, we've done a video just prior to this. If you haven't seen that already, I'll put a link below. And what that is, that's a brief overview of all the different styles of sheaves um, that are available to you from some that, are, some that are very crude, very simple, but yet still very effective, all the way to ones that are a little bit more elaborate, like the one demonstrated in this video. Now also what that is, that's the kind of part one, and this is a part two, of an ongoing series on sheaves for spoon knives specifically. Now what we're going to do as we move forward, um, hopefully we're just in the middle of arranging the log logistics for me to come back down, spend another day with Lee in his workshop here today in Milton Keynes. And what we're going to do, we're going to explore more options available for making sheaves. Now based on discussions off camera, what we're potentially going to be doing is exploring Another couple of options that we have for wooden for wooden sheaves. We're looking at a hinge system and also a socket system as well. And a socket system, don't worry if you don't know what that is. Mm. Uh, we actually showed it in the previous video, but we'll, we'll be showing it obviously in detail on how to make one. But it's kind of uh, Lee's more preferred way of, of kind of making the sheaves. So I think based on our, our conversation off camera, we'll possibly explore yeah. uh, those two options. Yeah, there's definitely a couple more things that we can look at. And yeah, there's always more than one way to do a job. Yeah. We just started with the most basic and hopefully the most accessible to people with the tools they're likely, the tools and materials they're likely to have laying about. And this is another thing, this is another reminder, as we mentioned throughout this video and at the beginning, this is kind of like the, the fundamental way of making this particular style of wooden box sheet. The idea is this video is kind of designed more for those of you, including myself, that have never made one before and are kind of curious at how do you even go about this kind of thing. So this is exploring obviously just one of the options. We'll explore a couple more as we move forward uh, into the 
the future. But the goal is, is to kind of provide you a bit of a template to start off with. You know, if you haven't explored a particular project ever before in whatever discipline, it's always good to start off with a simple project to begin with, Definitely. learn some of the fundamentals, and then you can run with it. So, you know, I think a final thing we just touch on, which is kind of self-explanatory, but obviously decoration is kind of the world's your oyster, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you could chip carve this, paint it. That was part of the reason for wanting to use glue. The only piece of metalwork is removable, it's that screw. Other than that, there's nothing to damage a knife on, nothing to catch, nothing to find inside the wood that's going to cause problems. It's just basically a piece of wood that's been reassembled. So we can remove that to decorate it, to paint it, whatever. So yeah, maybe we'll look at that another time as well, making yeah. it a bit prettier. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Another thing, a bit of a spoiler, um, once again, we're feasible logistics wise, uh, moving into the very near future. Um, Lee's a very dab hand when it comes to things like chip carving and disciplines like that. So once again, with Lee's client permission, we're gonna be exploring that as well. So obviously you kind of combine the two together. But the point being for this particular video, this was to kind of illustrate to you as well as to myself, the kind of the step-by-step -step formula to make this particular style of wooden sheath. And obviously you use this as a template to obviously explore yourself and kind of go off with your own creation. Activity. So guys, I really do hope you found that useful. Like I said, it was the first time I've seen the entire process myself, so it was a real eye-opener in terms of saying, oh, okay, these are the subtle nuances you've got to be wary of, uh, and obviously a general process that I can now go away and attempt it myself. So links below to everything that I mentioned. A final reminder also, I forgot, is uh, uh, Instagram and Lee's website below as well. It's a great way of seeing the, the work that he's done in the past. Um, so I'll put links below that uh, to that also. Um, and and that is it. So are there any passing words from yourself, Lee? No, I think we've, I think we've done all right, haven't we? Yeah, covered, we've done really well. Bases, so yeah, it's been good fun as well. I've enjoyed yeah. it. So. No, it's been really great. Thank you once again, Lee. I really do mean that. Yeah, you good. know, he's a busy guy, man. So for him to take out an entire day from me, I'm really, really appreciative of. I know the, the, the viewers that are familiar with you are always asking about, you know, cool. when you're getting back to see Lee, you know, <laughs> uh, and stuff. So I really appreciate you taking the time out. Yeah, it's good to be um, back. So guys, really do appreciate you watching. If you watch all the way through, link to everything down below. Stay tuned. Like I said, we're already in discussions about future videos. One set of videos obviously continuing the series with the spoon knife shears, and another one we're exploring some decoration techniques as well. I'm going quite deep into that. Things that I haven't yet covered in detail on my channel, so I'm really looking forward to that too. So guys, once again, sincere thank you for watching, and I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Lee Stoffer and myself, Zed Outdoors, peace out. Take care.